Um, yeah, so um, I'm talking about uh, how we use uh, SAR data for global dynamic monitoring of the land surface. Um, and uh, from the time that I've been professor at Theovin, we focused on the topic of uh, the, the, the hydrology, the hydrological cycle. Uh, so we have always looked at soil moisture and flooding. Uh, and uh, what we've been seeing in the last few years is like this accumulation of extremes. And uh, if you if you watch the news, uh, there's always this this mod, this this tenor. Um, well, we've never seen this before, and uh, people always seem to be surprised that uh, such a big event is coming. Um, so the the headlines are very strong. Um, and, and just looking at what some of the headlines we had recently in Austria uh, at the beginning of this September. Uh, we had a still a heat wave and a drought situation, and one week later we had this enormous flooding uh, with uh, rainfall uh, records uh, that, well, were not anticipated. So there's clearly a very big need that we do a better monitoring of floods and droughts and, and for the characterization of the hydrological cycle. And I think there's lots of opportunities out there. There's so many much more sensors on airborne platforms, on satellite platforms, also in situ. But still it feels if there's a crisis situation that you still have too little data. Um, so we, we, we've also faced the, the problem that, say, climate change pushes the water and energy cycle into an unknown territory, so we are not really often not prepared. Um, and the other aspect is that the net land surface is not natural any longer, so models that have been calibrated in the past may not work any longer because everything has changed already in the meantime. And what is so particularly challenging in when, it, when you want to monitor floods and drought is that the processes are very dynamic. Uh, so you need to have a short revisit time. Uh, and obviously, we have good short revisit times with, uh, say, meteorological sensors with the core spatial resolution. But if you go to the high resolution, uh, I mean, three days is nice, but it's not what we need for very dynamic monitoring. Um, the other challenging aspect is the, well, we humans, we modify the land surface uh, at very small scale, and this also has an impact. So we also somehow need to capture this. So we need, we also need high resolution. and. It, that's very, very challenging from a scientific point of view and I also think from a management point of view of how to deal with data in the long term is you need to put the extremes in the context. It's not enough just to collect data and then you have an image and that's fine. If you want to understand extremes, you need to do a regular reprocessing. And that's a message currently to Europe. Here we are failing because we are not doing systematic reprocessing on many of the satellite data. Sometimes you get, oh, a nice Sentinel-2 collection, nice. But we have never had a single reprocessing of Sentinel-1, which is a disaster in my point of view. But Sentinel-1, let, <laughs> let me also say, it's 10 years of Sentinel-1, so it has been a big success. Um, uh, it has really changed the way how, how we work with SAR uh, with data. Um, so, and, and the big, the big uh, step for Sentinel-1 was, like uh, all the SAR missions before, had many different modes. So the modes were competing with each other, and in the end, you, uh, you, the, the resulting database was not consistent. Uh, we never had a large-scale pattern and a regular repeat coverage. With the decision of ESA, uh, of some very wise people within ESA to go just for one mode over the land surface, the so-called interferometric Wadsworth mode with a swath width of 250 kilometers and a spatial resolution say in the order of, say, of 20 meters. We had a very good compromise between spatial resolution and coverage um, and because you focused on that one mode you also achieved a very good uh, data quality which would have been more uh, complex if you wouldn't have done this. Um, so with that, the Sentinel-1 became the first mission that's useful for soil moisture and flood monitoring. There's lots of propaganda material that we use commercial satellites, SAR satellites, for doing flood monitoring. Yes, they can zoom into certain flood events. Yes, they can give very nice images. And yes, if they, they want to repeatedly look at it, it's nice. But in the end, it's small, very small areas. They are not having full coverage. So we need to have like this, this systematic sensors like Sentinel-1 to get us the complete aerial overview and not just having a small focus on a very small area. 
Yeah, and uh, well, we are lucky that Sentinel-1A, which was uh, launched in 2014, is still ongoing. Uh, Sentinel-B, unfortunately, was already lost in 2021. So I'm, I'm very exciting and I hope that the launch for Sentinel-1C, either in November, December this year, will, will be successful. So all fingers crossed and uh, hope Sentinel-1D will not take too long to follow so that we have, again, two very nice operational systems. Just want to show you two of the services uh, that, that we are operating on behalf of the European Commission and the Copernicus program. So the one is part of the Copernicus land monitoring system where we do uh, one kilometer soil moisture monitoring at the moment at European scale, where we first do an aggregation of the data from, from the 20 meter scale to one kilometer and then do a soil moisture retrieval there. Um, we provide within that product not just the information, w uh, the, let's say, a soil moisture value, but we also try to characterize its uncertainty. And we also tell to the user where actually soil moisture cannot be retrieved. If it's now a water body or if it's a dense forest or if it's an urban area, we try to give this best possible information out there. Um, for many years, that service was kind of, uh, yeah, um, running on a more lower level. Uh, we are now very happy that we have now a major revis uh, like a major um, activity to make an update next year where we go to global coverage. We will improve the seasonal vegetation correction. Uh, we will move um, um, sub-pixel effects that are very uh, difficult to deal with, uh, like for example, subsurface scattering. Uh, we will do a better masking of snow and frost um, and we also will mask flood affected areas within the soil moisture product. Just to give an impression of that graphic, so some of you may have already seen it, but I still think it's so nicely illustrative what soil moisture is doing. So on the left side, you see a Sentinel-1 image of, uh, uh, yeah, of Netherlands. And the brown colors means the soil is dry, and blue colors means the soil is wet. On the right-hand side, you see this weather radar uh, animation. So the image, the Sentinel-1 image was uh, taken about 6 o'clock in the morning, and the animation from the radar, um, for the weather radar, starts around 2 o'clock in the morning. So then you nicely see how the weather, uh, the, the rainfall moves and leaves an imprint uh, of the water on the soil surface. Um, now it also uh, makes it a bit more easy to interpret like than the regular images that come in. So these are images uh, from, from a sequence of day, August 22, August 23, 4, 5, 25, 6. Um, you see the uh, coverage that Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B have been uh, providing on a daily scale. And you see kind of the weather patterns, say the, the large scale um, rainfall fronts uh, leaving these this, this stripes in the imagery. It also shows how extremely important it is to have a high temple coverage to actually uh, capture this uh, very dynamic phenomenon. Yeah, and in a recent project uh, uh, funded by ESA and, and led by Luca Brock, uh, the, the digital twin hydrology project, we were fortunate that we could uh, improve our algorithm. This will actually then go also into the Copernicus service, uh, where we managed to deal with some of the very difficult subsurface scattering phenomena, because if the soil dries out, actually the radar looks deep into the soil that can cause very weird effects. So, uh, and in the Mediterranean, that was very challenging and we could take them out. Yeah, and one thing that kind of links this rainfall to, to soil moisture, uh, again, this is Lucas idea and uh, uh, has, has been a very big success. Um, normally, you estimate soil moisture from precipitation. Um, well, here we turn it around, so we take a land, so he takes the land surface uh, model and basically turns it around so that rainfall becomes the derivative of uh, soil moisture. So if there's a positive soil moisture change, there was some rainfall input, and that's called SM to rain method. It has been uh, very successfully applied to ASCAT, SMAP, and small data. Um, and now in this project, we also applied it for the first time for Sentinel-1 with the effect that this is the first time a, uh, a rainfall estimate at one kilometer scale. The downside is it's not working yet on a daily time step because the temple uh, sampling is not good enough. But say the estimates at the moment are maybe good at the monthly time scale, not, not, not better. But I think it's a really big step forward and shows the potential if you would have like high resolution soil moisture data much more often. 
The second service we've started uh, in, in uh, three years ago, again on behalf of the European Commission, uh, as part of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. It's a fully automatic global flood monitoring system where we do uh, flood monitoring at 20 meter resolution within six time after sensing. So all the data are being processed automatically. Again, what's the difference to before? Uh, before people, well, there was a f they said, well, here's a flood, let's try to get an image. And then maybe the satellite was tasked or an image was taken from an archive and then manually analyzed. Here we do everything fully automatically with the effect that, well, 99% of the images are not analyzed for much purpose because there's no flood in there. But for those images where you capture the flood, you are really in the shortest time, time scale uh, in terms of delivery to the user. It's also, also obviously a very challenging approach because even if your algorithm is really, really good, because most of the images don't show floods, you have misclassifications. So in the end, uh, when we started the service, uh, there was uh, lots of discussion with users and, and now they're into it and understand the strengths and weaknesses of the product. I think it has become very successful. Um, we also do one novel thing here is that we have three state-of-the-art scientific algorithms that were combined in ensemble. So one from our colleagues from DLR, one from our from Luxembourg List Institute, um, and there's also kind of giving us yeah, also insights into how our different algorithms work and make the product stronger. And again, we give context through different output layers like flood extent, likelihood, exclusion mask, advisory mask. The first time that this service was uh, really put into use and used by the by policymakers was in the, during the huge flood of in Pakistan in 2022. Um, so we had a paper then afterwards being published on this. So the area that was being flooded at that event had the size of whole of Belgium. So the whole of Belgium was underwater. So nothing comparable I've seen in, in the meantime, luckily. So it was a huge major event, uh, also with some of the flooded areas standing there for, for months. Um, yeah, that, that gives you an impression how, yeah, how, how amazing the impact on society must have been. Um, well, here's another much smaller event. Uh, I, was, I happened to be in Bosnia-Herzegovina at the time, and I was uh, traveling around, and then I was uh, seeing some flooded areas, and in the evening I checked the GFM website. So I had then pictures taken here from different locations of this large area that was flooded, and the smaller area where the three points towers to. Yeah, and then um, this is what, what we saw, also this smaller area here. Um, was, was capturing very nicely. So even small areas are sometimes very nicely captured during the flood. So, and, and then we, when we were asked to define the requirements for Sentinel-1 next generation, uh, the question was, what, what is kind of temporal revisit time you need? And that's what I defined at that time. I said, well, if you want to have small-scale flooding events, we need a temporal sampling of less than a day. If it's a medium-scale flood, it's a temporal sampling of one to two days. If it's large-scale flooding, maybe two to six days. I want to ask the question, was that really a good advice? Um, overall, I think it's not that bad. But now with the recent flood we had here in Austria, I would <laughs> like to push my requirements even further up. Uh, we would, have to had, would like to have many more images. Of course, we only have like only one Sentinel-1 uh, satellites flying at the moment. Two would have been much more useful. But still, uh, often we waited quite a long time until we had the next image. What was nice about Sentinel-1, but if you had, for example, a good image, so going from Austria over Czech Republic to, to Poland, that you really got the overview of the whole flooding event. Like in Austria, we didn't see so much actually in the terrain because Austrian flood defense is really good. So much of it was contained and there was hardly any dam breaks or whatever. So we didn't see it in the environment. But if you go to Poland, uh, that already was a different picture. Actually, most of the damages we had in Austria was from groundwater not from surface water. So we had huge infrastructure uh, damages and in, the, and in the households. Yeah, so this was, for example, a sequence. This was a bit at the start of the flooding event. Um, so we saw some areas being flooded. Uh, this was kind of uh, when, when at the end of, towards the end of the flooding event for an area, um, yeah, and this is a few days later. So again, also here, water was standing for some time. Actually, where there lots of water was standing, we have an atomic uh, 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 atomkraftwerk uh, standing there. It's not operating, but if it would have been operating, it would have been exactly in the water. 
So my takeaways from this uh, flooding event is that even for large-scale floodings and real situations, we need to have much better temple sampling. We need a sub -tailing. Um, we also need to make sure that we can use all the information um, that, that we have available. At the moment, we use only the VV polarization of Sentinel-1, so obviously we should also use the VH information. Um, higher spatial resolution would obviously be good, because some effects are very locally, uh, but again, I wouldn't compromise on the spatial coverage. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, we always need to make sure that users know what they get. So the question is, uh, will the next generation of satellites be able to deliver to improve this? So Sentinel-1 next generation will improve both on the spatial resolution and temporal sampling um, a bit, but it's going to be launched, uh, I don't know, 19, uh, 2033, 2034, it's about the time frame. There's also now at the moment a proposal for a geosynchronous SAR satellite. Uh, where the idea would be to have several acquisitions per day at the resolution, but the resolution is much coarser. Yeah? And this is only a candidate mission, so let's, uh, I, I keep my fingers crossed that it will make it this time into the selection of the final Earth Explorer. But again, we, if it's uh, selected, uh, it will also take uh, at least a decade until it's flying. So, well, now we've only considered C-band uh, systems. Obviously, there's also L-band uh, SAR systems, so with a, high, with a longer wavelength. We have systems like SARCOM and ALOS. Um, and in February, there will be the launch of the Big NISA mission. And ROS-L, so the L-band companion to the Sentinel-1 from the European Commission, will be launched around the 28th framework time frame. I hope that that works. So we've been starting with working with all the sensors, SARCOM and ALOS. I mean, it's nice, but it's not giving you coverage. Data quality is really a big issue. Yeah, so even though, for example, ALOS data access has much improved, and even though they may have now local uh, flood monitoring services on a global scale, it really doesn't help us. So NISA, I guess, will make a difference from next year on. Uh, so we want to start working with it, and uh, Rose L, obviously, we want to um, prepare for it. And it will make sense to jointly operate them. And now the question was, if you have Sentinel-1 and Rose L, if how do you jointly operate them? Um, and some people had to say, well, it's really nice if you could have the C-band and L-band data taken almost instantaneously to improve the retrieval, you know, to improve the accuracy of the retrievals. Yes, we believe that's possible. So if you have soil moisture and flooding, say L-band retrievals alone should be a bit better. And if you combine L-band and C-band, again, it will be a bit better. But it's not, you know, the world. It's an incremental improvement. And if I then can trade off this incremental improvement in accuracy and the way if I could optimize temple coverage, I would definitely go for temple coverage. So the requirements of the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service and the Copernicus Management Service are such that Sentinel-1 and ROS-L are such operated that the gap fill on a global scale on a daily basis. So now we are working towards a multi-frequency SAR data cube. Um, so at, if you look at the existing uh, data cube solutions, there's one at uh, the Google Earth Engine, and there's one at the Earth Observation Data Center here in Vienna. Um, if you look at the data, as how, for example, they're stored on the Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem, they aren't really optimized for use in a time series processing domain or uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult to work with them if you want to work with them on a large scale and, and in a time series format. I already mentioned um, Sentinel-1 data need to be reprocessed because there have been changes over the last 10 years. Uh, ESA is at the moment uh, planning in open source uh, code. Um, I hope that will be available sooner or later. Um, and then I hope there will be a reprocessing campaign. For NASA, the situation will be that these data will be hosted on the Amazon Web Service. So NASA hosts all its data there. Um, and these will already be presented in a new analysis where the data standard. Um, so already uh, the uh, Alaska SAR facility is already offering Sentinel-1 data in a new data format, and we Europeans lag behind. So many colleagues go to Alaska SAR facility to get our data. Yeah, that's, that's really unfortunate. And one of the issues that kind of, uh, yeah, is, is, is keeping us, um, uh, well, when we started working with Sentinel-1, we asked the question, what is the best grid we could work with uh, such a data set at a global scale? 
at 20 meters. And we came up with a definition that we said, well, let's look at the continental scale system that we have for each continent, a, a grid system, and we called it the Equi-7. Um, and now with, with all the European data, we have the situation that 30 years ago, the UTM system was introduced for Landsat. Because UTM was used for Landsat, they choose to use it for Sentinel-2. Because they choose it for Sentinel-2, now they choose it for Sentinel-1. But it's a great, it was a great standard for the last 30 years. It's not a great standard any longer if you want to do large-scale processing activities and time series analysis. And the interesting thing is, uh, the US is now thinking about changing, going to a continental-scale grid system in two years. Yeah? So we've gone through a continental grid system called Equi-7. Yeah, and Tom and his team have been one of the users uh, to test it uh, and see how it works. Um, it's based on equi equi a smooth equidistant projection, which I think is the best compromise in, order to, in terms of spatial grid size and the uh, say distortion of the grid. Unfortunately, NASA or USGS plans to have an equal area, which will be very bad at the borders of the, of the, the continents. Like if you have data that in Japan, it will be really distorted. It's not a good decision. So let's see if they, they will stick to that. Yeah, and we've built up a global monitoring system. So in a sense that uh, we, the data are being incoming, fully automatically processed, and you build up a data cube. Uh, and the data cube is really important in order to do the model parameterization. If you have a physical model or if you have a machine learning model, it doesn't matter. You need some time series on a per pixel basis to actually do the calibration. So what we do typically is we train our models, again, physical models or machine learning models on the data cube and then can apply it in the near real time scenario. Yeah, and everything, the question was, can we do this? Um, and, and I think what the good thing about the Earth Observation Data Center, which is a collaborative effort where many organizations work together to jointly acquire hardware. Uh, both to run supercomputing capabilities and, and the storage capability, yeah, we actually we could handle it. So we have now several petabytes of data and we have supercomputers, both with CPUs and GPU units to actually process the data on a global scale. So we can do what people do on the Google Earth engine there. Yeah, and I think the other very positive development obviously is that we start to be able that was a vision that we always had in the EUDC that we want to federate. We never wanted to do everything ourselves, but we wanted to federate. And 10 years ago, that wasn't possible. And now we have, thanks to, again, the open science community, for example, organized by the Pangeo group, uh, that we start to have very powerful tools that we can start connecting all the different platforms together. Because there will never be just the one platform. As, we've, as Tom said, we already have in Europe, we have several competing platforms and we need to make working them together. And now with, uh, say, tools like Stack or Dask or Jupyter and OpenEO, we can make them actually work together and uh, do even large-scale processing. Yeah, with this, I come to the conclusions. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I would see extremely high value in, in developing a co-located SIP and an L-band um, SAR backscatter data cube. Uh, obviously, we always think towards P-band as well. Uh, and there would also be a very big benefit of having a co-located system together with Landsat uh, and Sentinel-2. Um, just for, say, the flood and soil moisture, the improved temporal sampling and the improved thematic accuracy will, will be very big gains. So I, I, I would hope in four years, uh, the, say, a flood situation like, this, this, like we had now in Austria will be fully different um, covered. So we want to uh, start creating a nicer backscatter data cube co-located to our Sentinel-1 data cube in Vienna. We have the storage systems. We just need to get the data to Europe. Uh, so the plans are to do a first pre-processing of the data at the Amazon cloud and then get it over there. Uh, so what is difficult for us at the moment is yet to estimate the, the, the processing costs at the Amazon cloud and the egress costs so for downloading. Say, I was a bit worried that about this, the latest discussions with the Alaska Surface the team said, well, we think we can support that. Yeah. So I hope that's true. Um, 
So that would be would allow us to bring those data to Europe and, and make it available to everybody who is interested here. Yeah. And we need to go from their UTM system because they're also still in UTM to the Equi7, so to, to facilitate this. So that's something we will do. Okay, with this I would like to stop and thank you very much for your attention.